Can I get a drum roll, please? And welcome to the long-awaited devlog number 12. It has been a hot second, hasn't it? Well, let's shake off the dust and jump straight into things. Back when I was planning out Sick Transit, I always knew there would be three large technical hurdles that I would have to clear in order to actually make the game. The first two being movement and the wrapping algorithm for the grapple. Now, neither of those are ideal at the moment. However, I think they both just need refining and value fiddling and ultimately I'll be very content with them. The last big challenge being the NPC system. I think I explained in the frequently referenced inspo log episode, take a shot, that I wanted the overarching plot of the game to be delivering messages between NPCs that are part of a conspiracy and that I want it to be quote dynamic to a degree. Meaning depending on certain player actions or inactions, different things occur. Now, I could either set up a gigantic branching plot system, but my god, my brain would not be able to handle all that. Instead, I want a system where the NPCs are playing a hidden role game, and they're all pursuing strategies based on their own and all the other participants' quote, personalities, in order to win said game. And you would just be delivering the messages between them. I just had to actually figure out how to set all that up. I've been doing a lot of brainstorming and planning, and I'm not even remotely close to implementing it fully, but I think I've got an actual path forward. It involves me writing hundreds, if not thousands, of individual messages, so it's going to take a while, but I always felt that I was going to end up doing that anyways. Now I do have enough notches in my game dev belt to realize that yeah, I want that all to be in an external file, so that way I don't have to launch the RAM devouring UE4 editor just to write a few lines of dialogue. Or worse, launch Visual Studios. It's a public fact that I use Emacs when I can. Not throwing any shade at Vim, I used it for years, and I use Evo mode in Emacs because what was Stallman thinking with those keybinds? I even have a pleasant Dur Locals setup for Sick Transit to handle some basic stuff. As you can tell by my quirky editor choice, I also use things that I probably shouldn't. So when I realized I was going to be writing external files, I automatically thought XML. I know I shouldn't, but I like using XML more than JSON. UE4 even has an XML parser, plus I find it easier to use regex to parse XML than JSON, and I figured Emacs being as powerful as it is, it must have a robust linter for XML. I just simply have to supply it with a DTD file and I'd be off to the races. Thus began my week of folly. Turns out the rest of the world, or the Emacs community at least, has left me and my XML ways behind. Emacs can lint XML, but not using a DTD file. It needs an RNC file, which is like a DTD file, but different format. I tried writing a RNC file or whatever and giving that to Emacs, but no dice. So I found some ancient software that was last written for Java 8 that supposedly would convert a DTD file to what I needed without any hassle. However, no dice as well. So after banging my head on the wall for a bit, I gave up. For Sick Transit, I renounced my XML ways and I'm using JSON. Now, I definitely don't want to just have to write out all the necessary JSON each time I want another entry. This time, Emacs did not let me down. I added another handy dandy little script to my dir locals, so that way I could insert a message snippet whenever Emacs is in a JSON file. Ah, the joys of Lisp. As you can see, it's a lot more than just the message itself. It contains a bunch of metadata that the NPCs will take into account when choosing which message to send. As you can see by the personalities, these NPCs are going to be just charming. Anyway, I'll talk more about this system once it's further fleshed out. I've created a character model as well. As you can see, I have it fully modeled, textured, and rigged. I think I've settled on a good workflow for 3D models. I'm still extruding the cube, but I'm focusing more on silhouettes than anything else. Then for texture painting, I paint with values first, then add color. And if I want to do some tweaking, I just use the shader editor before finally baking to an external texture. This is going to be a background NPC that are all over the levels doing menial tasks or just, you know, vibing. Ideally, you'll be able to ask them for 
for basic directions, but they won't be able to talk after all. They have no mouths, nor belly buttons, but they will be able to point the way. Yeah, the tri count is too high for PSX or N64. Call the low poly cops. I don't care. And while I do love making my own rigs, I used MetaRig this time, and I think I'll be continuing to use it whenever possible. I love it. It's just so convenient being able to delete the bones I don't need, then with the click of a button I get a full and extremely robust rig. Really expedites the entire process. Now I just have to shake off the old animation rust. It has been an even hotter second since I've made animations, and I'm not familiar with the Blender to UE4 animation pipeline, but you know, there are probably dozens of YouTube tutorials that got me covered. Finally, another demo day is coming up. I won't be entering this one either, hopefully I will in November, but I will be playing through a number of demos and uploading them here, looking at you or fellow dev, and give feedback to the dev in question. And I ask that you all do as well. All the demos are free, and if you're interested in game development, this is an excellent way to dip your toe in and be involved with the process. It's hard for a lot of small devs to get feedback, which is just so badly needed. There are bound to be entries in every kind of genre, so whatever your jam is, I'm certain you'll find something you can enjoy. The link to the demo day is in the description. Check out the entries. And that's it for this episode. I hope you all enjoyed getting a devlog again, finally. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to watch this, and I hope you have a good day. I put out videos every two weeks, and if you want to follow along with either devlogs or the math series I'm working on, or my next TEDx talk about some crazy thing, please subscribe. And if you have any questions or comments in general, please leave a comment. I love getting them, and I love reading. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'll probably be posting there more frequently now that I'm picking up the pace of development again, and I also post photos of stuff I bake on Twitter when I bake them. See the description for my Twitter link. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. So I'm actually trying out a cake recipe here. I'm still in my French phase, you know, because of the macaroons and I had leftover chocolate ganache. So I wanted to, you know, I just didn't want to just eat the chocolate ganache by itself. So I tried out a cake. It's a gâteau de mamie, which is a French yogurt cake. Uh, you know, oh, and you'll have to excuse my pronunciation. I, I don't speak French. I just know the cooking French, basically. Uh, so yeah, I'm using the leftover chocolate ganache in the middle uh, because, again, I <laughs> if, if I didn't use it, I was just going to eat it by the spoonful. And um, the yogurt cake recipe is actually pretty simple. Oh, I'm also using the... Uh, leftover cream cheese frosting uh, from the macarons as well. So again, this is a largely the leftover cake. The yogurt cake recipe is actually, it's great. It's really simple. Uh, and that's why I tried it out because I prefer simple recipes, <laughs> which is, you know, doesn't actually vibe with the macarons and all that. But I like, I like simple stuff, um, especially because, you know, I don't have to break out the food scale just to make it. And this one uses uh, cups and such. So it's a really easy recipe. And if we cut to the mint sec or the cross section, as you can see, I really lathered that cream cheese frosting on. Um, as, as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not really good at making cakes. Uh, this is, I think this is like the first or second one I ever tried, but you know, it's a really, uh, the crumb on this came out really well. Like I'm, I liked the nice kind of yogurt tang and it was a good use for all that leftover chocolate ganache, which so, I mean, this is, as you can tell, this is actually a pretty small cake. I think it was about a, uh, maybe a four inch diameter. I have teensy spring forms that I used for it. So it actually it actually came out really great and I, it was just you know a personal cake i had a little i basically would eat half as dessert and then you know have the other half the next day so so yeah this was like my first time with this recipe i was extremely happy with it and if we skip ahead i basically tried it again if we look at this photo um as you can see i gave up with the whole frosting and i just did something really simple i had a lot of strawberries and they were starting to go bad and what i like to do is you know when that happens you know i still like the strawberries so I just macerate them, um, you know, put a little sugar on them, let them just soak in all the, release their juices, soak up the flavor. So I had a bunch of macerated strawberries and a bunch of strawberry juice. So I made another one, this one, you know, regular cake size. I think this one's about a 12, excuse me, 10 inch diameter here. 
And I used the same recipe and it came out really great. And as you can tell, this is a looker. I, sorry, I don't have any pictures of slices. I, uh, I, uh, this one was a gift. So I, you know, I gave it away, unfortunately. Apparently it was great and it was extremely moist and good flavor. Oh, and, uh, the, oh, the pink frosting is just a, what, it, what, I don't know what it's called, but you know, it's just, uh, powdered sugar and the strawberry juice. I mix those two together until I got, you know, frosting-ish consistency. Yeah, and as you can also tell, I've been practicing my piping, so that's how I got it to look. That's how I got this nice crosshatch pattern. But yeah, I it was a gift, and the couple that received it were really pleased. So and they said it was great and moist, and they loved it. And anyways, the classic sign-off. The yeast in the air is free. You should bake your own bread. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.